Hello and welcome to On Fire here on Daily Mirror Online. I'm Iswaran Ratnam. Our guest today is Sri Lanka's uh, ambassador to China, uh, Dr. Palita Kohana. Dr. Kohana, welcome to the program. How are you, Iswaran? So, uh, Dr. Kohana, you uh, you just uh, took up uh, the post as Sri Lanka's ambassador to China recently at a time when um, uh, Sri Lanka's relationship with China was uh, not that great as a result of uh, certain policy decisions taken by the former government. Um, since you've taken over, how are things looking right now? I would say that the relationship is now on a very good footing, uh, but we are not going to rest here. We are going to make the relationship even stronger and warmer. Uh, it's, uh, in the case of China, China has been a good friend of Sri Lanka for a long time, but we never take anything for granted. In, uh, I, that's a lesson I learned a long time ago. So we will uh, continue to work uh, on strengthening and consolidating and advancing this relationship to a high level. Is there a specific area that uh, Sri Lanka is focusing right now in its relationship with China? Well, first and foremost, as I said earlier, uh, my primary goal will be to consolidate and advance this relationship. Uh, and it, that will be at a political level. And of course, uh, very importantly, and in parallel, we will uh, improve our bilateral economic relationship, uh, improve, uh, enhance our exports to China, China being the most lucrative consumer market in the world today, uh, encourage uh, inward investments from Chinese companies. Again, China is one of the major exporters of investment capital in the world. And thirdly, uh, we will do our best to encourage more Chinese travelers uh, to visit Sri Lanka. China is again, in almost every respect, China is the biggest and the most lucrative. China is the biggest source of tourism uh, in the globe today. 169 million Chinese traveled overseas in 2019 before COVID-19 dampened the enthusiasm for travel. So we hope that uh, a significant number of Chinese travelers will consider Sri Lanka to be their destination of choice in the future. And we will certainly make every effort. We will not leave any uh, stones unturned and doors unopened as we approach this goal. Uh, um, um, when we look at tourism, uh, is there any move to maybe uh, look at having a, a, a travel bubble between uh, China and Sri Lanka? Both sides are talking about it. As you know, China is, uh, has been phenomenally successful in controlling uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, hardly a trace of it is left in China. It, it, it's done a wonderful job in controlling this uh, terrible infection. And Sri Lanka is, hasn't done too badly. So there's every possibility of a bubble being uh, arranged by the two countries on a mutual basis, and we are talking about it at the moment. And I know you've also been discussing with the Chinese authorities uh, on uh, the vaccine, um, Sinopharm. Uh, what's the status of that, uh, Dr. Kohana? Well, as far as we are concerned, we've done what has to be done. We've, we've talked to the two major Chinese vaccine producers, Sinopharm and Sinovac. Both uh, have uh, been very receptive our requests to make the vaccine, Chinese vaccines available to Sri Lanka. We've talked to the foreign ministry, uh, again, received a very positive response from them. Um, and then also uh, to the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. Uh, the foreign ministry, in fact, this was about four or five weeks ago, rang me on a Sunday night to let me know that China will be gifting 300,000 uh, doses to Sri Lanka. Subsequently, they have added another 300,000. Uh, so we conveyed all this to Colombo. Now it is for the Sri Lankan authorities to register the Chinese vaccines 
for emergency use. We are waiting to hear from them. Um, and and I know uh, in one of your meetings uh, with the Chinese government, I think it's with the with the with the vice uh, foreign minister. Uh, there was mention of uh, the FTA between Sri Lanka and China as well, uh, and that they also want to see not just that, but they also want to see some of the projects uh, that they are involved in in, in Sri Lanka with the Hambantota Hambanto industrial zone uh, and the port city. Also, those projects also to be expedited. Um, what, has, what's, what are you hearing from the Chinese side on these issues? There are, there are two, two issues here. One is the question relating to the FTA. Uh, the FTA is on the table. We've been uh, discussing the FTA for the last seven years or more. Uh, the Chinese authorities would like us to expedite this because one of the reasons why, in my view, why Sri Lankan exporters are doing so badly in the Chinese market is due to the absence of a document or an agreement in the nature of an FTA. Uh, Sri Lanka exports only about $260 million worth of, or exported only about $260 million worth of goods to China. China, on the contrary, exported close to $4 billion worth of stuff to Sri Lanka. Uh, there are many uh, obstacles that Sri Lankan exporters face uh, when accessing the Chinese market. Questions relating to quality, standards, uh, meeting Chinese requirements, uh, preferences, etc. All these issues come up and our exports are not doing too well, not as well as one would expect. We need to bump up the level of our exports to the Chinese market. China, after all, as I've said before, is the most lucrative consumer market in the world. And other countries are doing exceptionally well in this market. Australia, for example, exports something like 237 billion, not million, billion worth of stuff to China. Uh, so uh, Sri Lanka needs to do a little bit more. And one of the uh, tools that we can use for this purpose in my view, is the conclusion of an FTA. Uh, an FTA creates concerns in the minds of many people and justifiably so. An FTA depends on how you negotiate it and we need to uh, engage the best minds in this negotiation so that Sri Lanka will also benefit from it at the end of the day. Uh, there are other FTAs we have concluded, not that many, but uh, most of them come, have come in for criticism because Sri Lankan interests have not been adequately protected and advanced in those FTAs. Uh, the other issue that you raised is regard, with regard to Hambantota and the Kalamba port city, both were of which were uh, built with Chinese funding. Today, we need to attract investors to make use of the facilities that Hamantata provides, as well as the Colombo Port City provides. Uh, for this, we have said both areas are open to anyone from around the world, not only Chinese, uh, anyone from the US or America, uh, the, United, the European Union or India or Japan could come and, and make use of these facilities. My job, of course, is to try and encourage Chinese companies to to invest in these areas. We need those investments for two reasons. One, FDI is essential for Sri Lanka at the moment. And secondly, FDI will stimulate our economy, our, our employment prospects for our people and, and the export potential of this country. How would you respond? I mean, you know uh, very well that some countries are concerned about China's involvement in Sri Lanka. Uh, one of the concerns is uh, that it, it's one-sided, that these agreements are one-sided. And the other concern is that there's lack of transparency when it comes to Chinese investments uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka. How would you respond to uh, those concerns, Dr. Prabhupada? Uh, I believe that the opportunities given to Chinese companies are essentially to respond to Sri Lanka's needs. When Sri Lanka needs a power plant to be built and uh, and we need the funding for it, it's invariably a Chinese company that comes with the funding and the, uh, and the necessary structure 
for dispersing the funding. Um, I don't think at any stage the present government or any other government has simply uh, allocated uh, opportunities to Chinese companies alone. If there were competition and there were others coming into the fray, I don't think there was a deliberate effort, certainly not on the part of the current government, to exclude companies from any other country. It's just that the opportunities were there and the Chinese companies came and accepted those opportunities and the challenges involved. Uh, so that, that's one part of it. And then uh, we are talking about access to, you were talking about access to the Chinese market. Yeah. The access to the Chinese market, and China has consistently said that over and over again, that the Chinese economy is, the market is now more liberalized than many other markets. It is open to everybody. As I mentioned earlier, Australia exports $237 billion worth of products to China. Other countries export much more. The US exports much more. Uh, the opportunities that they are in China. We need to make use of that opportunity. The Chinese market is, is a massive market, a growing market, and it's for the exporter to, to work out means and work out ways and means of accessing that market. Uh, you can't blame uh, the Chinese for not uh, consuming Sri Lankan products because they're there are no legal restrictions on uh, Sri Lankan products entering the Chinese market. But there may be things that we still haven't mastered on how to access the Chinese market. Uh, we need to understand the quality that they require. There are customs regulations. There are phytosanitary restrictions. All these things need to be understood carefully so that we can access this market much more effectively, much more methodically. And I also mentioned earlier that we should be concluding the free trade agreement with China as soon as possible so that we can secure access to this market in a much more methodical and structured way. Do you, do you think uh, the pressure that's coming from the West is sort of uh, hampering uh, Sri Lanka's attempts to maybe gain more from its relationship with China? Uh, there, obviously, there is pressure because there is uh, not only on Sri Lanka, on, on many other countries. There is an effort to discourage developing countries uh, from getting too close to China. But then our future is ours uh, and we need to decide what is good for us. And we have to make up our own minds on whom we should rely on for, to secure our future, to make our future better. There's no, no use worrying about pressure when the most important pressure that we need to respond to is the pressure of our people for a better life, better standard of living, and a better future for their children. And when we talk about pressure, the human rights issue is something uh, that is now uh, the focus here on Sri Lanka. Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, what is the role that China is playing when it comes to human rights, ensuring that Sri Lanka is uh, taken off the table uh, at the Human Rights Council? As you know, the Human Rights Council is a very political body. Uh, China has categorically said that uh, it does not support the initiative uh, introduced by the UK supported by other Europeans or with regard to Sri Lanka. China will stand by us at the, they have said so categorically at this Human Rights Council. Uh, but as to whether China alone can uh, take that resolution off the table is, is a moot question because it all depends on how many votes can be mustered on one side or the other. China itself is also facing a lot of allegations of human rights on the Uyghur issue and so on. Uh, there's pressure on Sri Lanka to also, you know, put pressure on China to address these issues. I mean, you're, you're right there in Beijing. Do you, do you see these sort of things happening? Have you heard of these kind of things happening? I mean, I don't want to get involved in a debate that I'm not very familiar with. 
but I have been talking to my colleagues uh, and there doesn't seem to be that much of a concern amongst the colleagues that I have spoken to so far. And the number is quite a few, uh, including African uh, diplomats, uh, some European diplomats, uh, quite a number of Central Asian diplomats. I don't think that a, a significant concern has been expressed by any one of them about the condition of the Uyghurs. Uh, as in the case of Sri Lanka, there are certain countries which are determined to raise issues in situations where there are no issues, create confusion where there is no confusion, and embarrass Sri Lanka internationally, uh, name and shame Sri Lanka. This is a political uh, initiative. This is part of a political agenda. It has very little to do human, with human rights or, uh, or, or what is, or facts. I, I believe the same is true of the Uyghur, so-called Uyghur issue in Xinjiang. The Chinese government has said so, and in fact, today there was a statement in, in the local newspapers that the, the government, the Chinese government categorically uh, rebutted the allegations made about the situation in Xinjiang. Um, you were foreign secretary at one time. Um, how does how does Sri Lanka balance its relationship with China and the West with all these uh, these issues and allegations and concerns being raised? I think that's that is where diplomacy uh, comes into play. Uh, Sri Lanka is not unique in this respect. There are other countries, not many, but there are others which are coming under pressures from different directions. And it is for us to balance our, those pressures, giving priority to our national interests. At the end of the day, we as a country must survive, prosper, and advance. And it is the national interest that must always predominate. Uh, the West will have its own priorities. And you know that for 300 years, 400 years, the West tried to dominate Sri Lanka. Some countries of the West tried to dominate Sri Lanka. Britain actually did dominate the whole island for 133 years. Now, uh, they did that for 130 years. Now they are making allegations about a country uh, that is far away from us, has not sent a single soldier onto our, uh, onto our soil, has not sent a single gunboat into our isn't, harbors. Isn't, uh, isn't the concern, Dr. Corona, that with so many Chinese investments, so many Chinese funded projects in Sri Lanka, that it may come to a situation where, like Britain ruled us, eventually, I mean, this is what people are saying, that China might rule us as well. That's a, that, I think that's a quite a funny argument. We need the investment. We need to advance the country. We need to prosper. We need to make our future secure. We need to make the future of our children secure. We need the investments. And we've asked for investments from everywhere. We've asked for investments from the West. We've asked for investments from other countries. And when they don't turn up and the Chinese turn up, why are we criticizing that? In fact, I'm glad that the Chinese stepped in and the others turned their faces away. That the others decided to whistle in the wind while we were desperately trying to better ourselves, and the Chinese came in to help us. So what's the problem with that? Um, where is, uh, I mean, looking ahead, uh, uh, what sort of uh, uh, investments or offers are we looking at from China? Are we seeing more Chinese-funded projects, uh, mega projects uh, likely in the future? Uh, I, well, we are working on a number of projects. I, I, I don't even intend to talk about them at this stage. We're working on an, uh, quite a num range of projects. But when I say that, and then as having, after having been the foreign secretary of this country at one point, and also uh, the permanent representative in New York, we have tried then, and we continue to try to encourage uh, big companies from the West, from Europe, from uh, India, to come and invest in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka offers uh, unparalleled opportunities to investors. We sit in the middle of the Indian Ocean 
On the West, we have Africa, which has, which has a booming economy at the moment. I mean, African countries are doing very well economically. We have the uh, Middle East. We have India next door to us. Again, uh, if not for Corona, COVID-19, would have been prospering uh, in an unprecedented way uh, at the moment. On the East, we have ASEAN and then Australia. We sit in the middle of all these uh, prosper uh, prosperity and uh, booming econo economies. So anybody coming and investing in Sri Lanka will have access to this range of markets. We have been trying to get Europeans, Americans, Indians, and Japanese and others to come and invest here. Uh, but my job is to encourage the Chinese and I will continue to do that. And there are many uh, large Chinese companies who have shown considerable interest in what we have to offer and we will continue to encourage them. Uh, what can Sri Lanka uh, gain from uh, the Belt and Road Initiative? I know China is, uh, has been discussing a lot uh, with Sri Lanka on that. Uh, for us to make better use of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, is there something that we are not doing that we can do better? I think we can do much better with the Belt and Road Initiative. We need to think more carefully and uh, identify the areas where the Belt and Road uh, largest can be exploited. China has said that it will allocate something over four trillion dollars, not really a trillion dollars uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative. Already some countries are doing extremely well out of this. Uh, Pakistan has been offered $56 billion for its various projects. Uh, uh, Bangladesh has been offered another large sum of money, uh, fund, funding for its projects. Uh, even Malaysia, has used it, Thailand has, Vietnam, Laos, etc. Sri Lanka can benefit from it hugely, but we need to work out what we need and how we are going to use it and uh, attract those funds to Sri Lanka also. Uh, we have the Hambantota Harbour, which has enormous potential, plus the export processing zone next to it. We have the Colombo Port City, which, if properly marketed, can benefit this country enormously. And they both come under the Belt and Road uh, Initiative's uh, scope. So there, are, there is potential, there is possibility, but it's for us to work out what we want and how we get it. And uh, finally, Dr. Kohana, I mean, looking ahead, uh, how do you see uh, Sri Lanka and China's relationship moving forward? I think uh, there's very little doubt that the two countries will uh, maintain a very warm and close relationship. Uh, the two leaders have been in communication with each other. Uh, our president, uh, uh, Mr. Rajapaksa, and uh, President Xi Jinping, the prime minister, uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa, has also been in touch with his counterparts in China. And there are others in the past who have had connections, if not for the COVID-19 pandemic, by now we would have had a high level visit to China from Sri Lanka. It hasn't happened because of this unfortunate situation. Uh, I'm hoping that very soon that there will be a visit, a high level visit from Sri Lanka to China. The Chinese leadership is definitely looking forward to that. Uh, there is much enthusiasm for Sri Lanka. There, it's a, I must say that uh, the, the warmth that I sense around me from the Chinese the political leaders, from the business community, and the average person in the street is phenomenal. It's unprecedented. I've not seen this much enthusiasm for Sri Lanka in any other country that I've been to. Uh, in addition, we are also trying to get a large number of Chinese to consider Sri Lanka as a possible travel destination and they're making their travel plans. This will happen as soon as the airports are open, the border, borders are open and travel 
is permitted. Uh, I expect a large number of Chinese to consider Sri Lanka as a favored destination for themselves. Right, Dr. Kona, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us on this program. Thank you very much, Isfran.